Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. Whether it was a personal account or a government account, I did not send classified material and I did not receive any material that was marked or designated classified, which is the way you know whether something is. Yes, what a skillful, skillful speaker she is. Now, does America need a skillful liar as president? We've already had one for a number of years. Look how well that's doing. There's industrial rape in the Middle East by ISIS, and he says nothing. American heroes stop another Islamist from killing everyone on a train. Uh, and even the socialist president of France gives them the most distinguished and prestigious award France can offer, Legion of Honor, while your president shamefully once again shows which side he's on, which is his own side. But I want to tell you something. My books are like Persian miniatures. Yes, my books. If you think I'm going to be intimidated by some tin horns in the media who are overpowered by my genius, you're wrong. My books are Persian miniatures. They're written to last for a very long time. My last best-selling book was called Stop the Coming Civil War. And in Stop the Coming Civil War, I discussed Ambassador Chris Stevens' murder at the hands of Libyan terrorists between pages 66 and 72. It looks very much as if highly classified information about Ambassador Stevens' travel and security arrangements were communicated in emails Hillary Clinton sent and received and was stored on her unsecured server and were very likely to have been intercepted and communicated to the mob that killed Ambassador Stevens and three other Americans. There was an article in the New York Post published just yesterday that confirms everything I said in my book, and I'll read it to you, two paragraphs. U.S. intelligence officials so far have determined that at least four and as many as 305 of the more than 30,000 emails Clinton and her aides have printed out and turned over to investigators were classified at the time they were written, were classified at the time they were written. They include a 2011 message from Clinton's top aides that contains military intelligence from United States Africa Command gleaned from satellite images of troop movements in Libya, along with the travel and protection plans for Ambassador Christopher Stevens, who was later killed in a terrorist attack in Benghazi, Libya. Another staff email sent to Clinton in 2012 contained investigative data about Benghazi terrorist suspects wanted by the FBI. Both emails were classified TSSI, Top Secret Special Intelligence, and required the nation's highest security clearance to read. SI is a control system within the super secret designation known as sensitive compartmented information. Now I want to go back to this issue of the Africa Command. Okay, they include a 2011 message from Clinton's top aides that contains military intelligence from United States Africa Command gleaned from satellite images of troop movements in Libya along with the travel and protection plans for Ambassador Christopher Stevens, who was then knocked off. Do you remember what happened right after Benghazi? Do you remember how many generals were purged by Stalin, I mean Obama? Obama-Stalin purged four or five major U.S. generals, including a general in charge of the U.S. Africa Command, an African-American with 26 years of loyal service to the United States of America. He fired him. Why would he have fired the African-American commander of the Africa Command, because he knew too much. Stalin would have just had him shot. Obama just smears them and fires them. We've had a purge in the U.S. military, and I'm going to talk about that at some length today, as well as the incriminating Clinton email revealing Benghazi security to Libyan terrorists who killed Ambassador Stevens, as covered in my book, Stop the Coming Civil War. Let me start. Page 66 of my book, The Benghazi Murderers. Perhaps the most obvious example of how what I see as the decimation of our military is making us a pawn to the world's leftist movement is the murders 
are the murders in Benghazi. I would be remiss if I didn't explain how that night fits into what's happening to our military right now. Do you remember the general whom Obama appointed to replace McChrystal? It was David Petraeus. Petraeus lasted nearly two years before he resigned. By the time he left government service, Petraeus had graduated to the position of head of the CIA. The alleged reason he resigned? He had been involved in an extramarital affair. The administration had known about Petraeus's dalliance with the woman who wrote his biography since he was vetted to assume the position of CIA director. The administration had known about his affair for months before he resigned. Two of America's most experienced military commanders also lost their jobs in the wake of the Benghazi murders. General Carter Ham and Rear Admiral Charles M. Gwet were relieved of duty because they tried to intervene and prevent the loss of four Americans' lives. The first eyewitness to the Benghazi attack, a security guard who worked at the compound helping to protect American personnel, has made it clear that the State Department had known for a long time that an attack on the consulate in Libya was inevitable. Yet few steps were taken to fortify the compound or to otherwise secure it. Reference 18 in my book. And here's what former Assistant Secretary of Defense Frank Gaffney believes happened on the night of September 11th, 2012, based on the available evidence. The Obama administration appears to have been involved in a gun-running operation that was being managed by Ambassador Christopher Stevens out of the Benghazi Consulate. Stevens is alleged to have been coordinating the delivery of military weapons, including as many as 20,000 Stinger missiles, to, quote, rebel fighters involved in the overthrow of Libyan dictator Gaddafi. After Gaddafi was ousted, Stevens was said to be further coordinating a massive transfer of weapons to rebels in several Middle Eastern areas, including Syria. Many, if not most, of the rebels were affiliated with al-Qaeda. We were sending them weapons. Did you hear this? Page 67 of Stop the Coming Civil War. The Obama administration appears to have been supporting terrorism through providing weapons to the very Islamists the United States is supposedly fighting against in the war on terror. If this is true, the administration certainly feared that Stevens would make details of the gun running public. Was that the reason why, when the attack on the Benghazi compound began, the decision was made not to send help? Contrary to the Obama administration's official story, Gen General Carter Ham, then the commanding officer of the U.S. Africa Command, was receiving live communications from various intelligence assets that provided real-time details of what was happening on the ground. In addition, there were dozens of CIA operatives on the ground in Benghazi who could have been used to rescue those in danger. General Ham began organizing a spe special forces team to intervene in Benghazi immediately after he received news of the assault on the Benghazi ambassador's compound. Are you ready for the next statement from the Savage Nation in Stop the Coming Civil War? My books are written for posterity. They're not written uh, for profit. I write them so you have the information you need to know what your government is doing to you and the world. Let me continue. Page 68, Stop the Coming Civil War. Ham began organizing a special forces team to intervene in Benghazi immediately after he got the news. Even though he received the order to stand down, likely from Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, who may have been receiving his orders from Valerie Jarrett, Ham went ahead with his rapid response plan. In order to stop him, one source says that the administration had the commanding general apprehended. Ham was informed that he was relieved of his command, which stopped his attempt to save American lives. In making preparations to intervene, General Ham had been communicating with Rear Admiral Goet, commander of Carrier Strike Group 3. Goet, who like Ham, had received a desperate request for help from Stevens and his team, was also preparing the assets under his command to intervene and save the lives of those under attack in Benghazi. I think that Admiral Goet was relieved of his command because he wouldn't stand down and watch Americans die, as he may have been ordered to do by the White House. General Ham the general in charge of military assets in North Africa, and one of the men who could have saved the four lives that were lost in the Benghazi massacre, told a Republican congressman that he had not received any requests for military intervention in Benghazi. But 
After an official investigation, Admiral Goet, too, was disciplined, ostensibly because he had been accused of using profanity in a public setting and making at least two racially insensitive comments officials familiar with the investigation said. As I said to you before, Joseph Stalin shot his generals. Per, uh, Barack Obama just smears them and then fires them. But the difference is only marginal. The difference is marginal. We have a fascist dictatorship running this country. Let me continue from Stop the Coming Civil War. Page 69. No mention in their dismissals was made of Benghazi. I ask this question. Was it possible that Obama may have recognized that these two decorated military officers were patriots who put duty to their country first? Might he have thought that their refusal to deny help to Americans in Benghazi would have denied the administration the ability to cover up the fact that it was supplying weapons to, quote, rebels who were often fighting on the side of al-Qaeda? Might the president have been thinking that patriots like Gouet and Ham would stand in the way of his power grab if it became necessary? There were other casualties on the night of the Benghazi attack. Now, I'll read you more from Stop the Coming Civil War when I return on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Welcome back. Look, it's very, very unusual that I would read from a previous book of mine because many of you bought the book. It sold over 150,000, by the way. I'm not hungry for sales. It's an extreme big hit. It's a New York Times bestseller, Stop the Coming Civil War. And yes, it happens to be out in paperback now. Yes, it's coincidental. But the important point is that Hillary is lying, in my opinion. There's great evidence that she is covering up what were in the emails that she deleted. And America and the world wants to know what were in them. Nobody deletes emails of that magnitude unless they've got something to hide. And the Democrat Party knows it. And the Democrat Party knows that this is going to come to light, which is why they're bringing up the old uh, war horse who has no chance of winning at all, Joseph Biden. He is unelectable. We all know he's unelectable, but it shows you how desperate the Democrat socialist machine is that they drag him out and run him. He has no chance at all, even with millions of illegal aliens voting numerous times. So I'm reading from Stop the Coming Civil War. I'm not going to read the whole you know, entry pages 68 to 70, 66 to 72. But it looks to me, as I said in the book, based on the new information coming out from the New York Post and et cetera, that I was 100 percent right, that all my references were correct. And as if the highly classified info about Ambassador Stevens' travel and security arrangements were communicated in emails Hillary Clinton sent and received and was stored on her unsecured server and were very likely to have been intercepted and communicated to the mob that killed Stevens and three other Americans, which is why the entire Democrat machine is scrambling to make sure no one ever sees these emails. I want to read finally from page 71 of Stop the Coming Civil War. In January of 2014, the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence released its bipartisan report on the Benghazi terrorist attack. It contained information so shocking, I can't believe it hasn't been the focus of an investigation. The report stated, quote, as many as 15 individuals supporting the investigation or otherwise helpful to the United States have been killed in Benghazi since the September 11, 2011 attacks, close quote, reference 30. Fifteen people who helped us in Benghazi have been killed since then? Are we supposed to believe that those deaths are not somehow connected to the fact that these people helped us on that night? Are we supposed to believe that their deaths are just a coincidence? Or do you think that their identities might have somehow gotten into the hands of our jihadist enemies and that those who helped us are being systematically el eliminated by terrorists? The purging of our own seasoned military commanders may well go beyond what happened in Benghazi. I conclude this entry with that. Obama seems to be continuing his purge of the military in order to avoid the kind of refusal to obey his orders 
that occurred on the night of the Megazi attack. But his purge has other implications. The next uh, subhead is, is our military being emasculated? The answer is, of course, that's how women got into ranger school. You see, they said last week that the women had the same high standards as the other rangers. A typical Obama administration lie. I have a friend who's an army ranger going back to the 1960s. He fumes with rage when he hears that statement. He said to me, they're lying through their teeth. They've lowered the standards so sufficiently under Obama that virtually anybody can be a ranger right now, which is why the women were able to graduate. He explained to me what ranger school used to be like and what it's become under Captain Kangaroo in the White House, your esteemed commander in chief. Now look, if all of this was new information, I wouldn't be giving it to you on the radio right now because I would worry for my own safety. But since all of this has been published and widely disseminated in many different places, I leave it to you, my loyal listeners, to understand the danger this republic is in, in the hands of the most terroristic administration imaginable. This man has done more damage to our military than Al-Qaeda has done it's in its entire uh, operational history in terms of firing the best and the brightest and making the best and the brightest to remain get out as fast as they can. The phone number here is 855-407-282. I guess I should take a few phone calls on the Savage Nation. Let's go uh, to uh, WMAL line two. Go ahead, please. What's on your mind? Hello. Yes, go ahead, please. You're on a national show. Please speak up. Okay, I have two quick points. When the coffins were coming off the plane at the Benghazi, you know, the funeral, yeah. Hillary Clinton went up to the podium where Barack Obama was, and they shook hands, like a very firm handshake, like we got away with it. Yes, we came. We saw he died. Yes, indeedy. And she would be president. She would be president. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Okay, welcome back to the Savage Nation. The war on the U.S. military began a long time ago. It didn't begin with Obama. It began before Obama. It began under George Bush. As you well know, many of our decorated Marines were court-martialed. Some of them are still in um, Fort Leavenworth for doing the horrible job of being soldiers. George Bush crucified our military, make no mistake about it. The leftist machine has long been embedded in the Defense Department and is now coming to a, to a head. So when I criticize the president and his regime for attacking the military and the insidiousness of Obama's military evisceration plan, uh, one that has already seen hundreds of high-ranking officials dismissed, I am warning you that it not only has removed our best and most dedicated soldiers, it has destroyed morale across our armed services. When capable young soldiers who once thought of making a career in the armed forces see what's happening to their superior officers, they decide to leave military service. And those who stay have to navigate a minefield of Obama's left-wing fanatics just to do their job in the military. That's a quote from Chapter 4 of Stop the Coming Civil War. And I, again, I have to refer to my own work. I began as a writer, not as a talk show host. Every one of the words I write is carefully selected. I am a careful writer. All of my books are Persian miniatures. And I want to say one other thing about my writing. It's very important you know. Most of what you hear about immigration today can be found in all of my books going back to the beginning in the year 1994. Much of what you hear on the radio are direct quotes from my books over the years on immigration. I'm glad to see it. As Lao Tzu said, it does not matter who is using your ideas what matters only is that your ideas are being used. So that's fine. But you should understand I know what I'm talking about. And now that America is talking about what I've been talking about and have been castigated for talking about since 1994 on the radio, you'll come to understand why it's uh, so important 
to listen to the show. Now, sometimes I go into lifestyle things as I did yesterday on the molestation, which is wonderful. I think it's important to do human, uh, human, um, human issues. Let's put it to you that way. But on a day like today, when we're facing such a crisis of confidence in the government and such a fraud who is running for office, it's not as if she's an unknown presence. It's not as if we hadn't had eight years of the Clinton machine in America. She's not a fresh face. This is a very dangerous situation. After seven or eight years of Obama, when he's finally gone, if he does leave, we need the exact polar opposite. We need someone to fire everyone that was hired by Obama and use executive orders to throw them out of every executive service where they are embedded, they think, in permanent jobs. He needs to purge. When Mr. Trump wins the presidency, he needs to purge the government of government zero. He needs to go through the entire government with a fine-tooth comb and get rid of all of the Obama appointees, whether it's in defense or education or the NIH. And it's not so funny that when he was on my show last week, I not so jokingly said, Mr. Trump, when you become president, I ask only one thing, and that is you consider hiring Michael Savage to head up the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And you know what he said? He said, I need bright people when I'm president. And I got a warning for all of you deadbeats in the NIH and the NSF and all of the other governmental agencies. If I ever get such a position, and don't laugh me out of the park, it may happen. You never know what might happen. I will cut your budgets by 25% the first day. I will fire 25% of you. I will end all of the foreign travel, the boondoggles that you call research. I will reorient all of your research. There will be no more global warming nonsense coming out of the NSF and the NIH. We will do basic science and basic medicine again. So you better pack up your stethoscope, girls, because there's just liable to be a new sheriff in town come a few years from now. But let's move back to government zero under Obama. No borders, no language, no culture. And let's focus for a moment, if you think that I'm just using hyperbole, on what happened in France over the weekend, which we talked about, and many people have talked about. A Muslim fanatic boards a train with a machine gun and a knife, and he wants to execute as many people as he can because he hates people. He hates people, he hates the West, and he wants to cause mayhem. He wants to conduct a one-man army, as they are being taught to do in Syria and other places. They're being sent back. He was known by four intelligence services, but they're all paralyzed, as is our government zero here. You think that we don't have them here with machine guns and bombs ready to go? And you think the CIA and the FBI and the DHS don't know who they are? Oh, they know, but they're paralyzed. They're paralyzed because they're government zero. They should preemptively arrest them, pull them out by their filthy hair, and arrest them and detain them before they kill us. But let's go back to France. After this time bomb goes off on the train, three American soldiers off duty subdue this piece of human trash, this throwback, this subhuman animal, and subdue him. And what happens next is very interesting. The socialist president of France just the other day grants our boys the highest honor that France can award, the Legion of Honor. I have no respect for Hollande. He may be a socialist, but he has pride. He has dignity. He has judgment. He has sense. And what did your president say uh, to our heroes who saved all those people on the train? Nothing. He gave a limp, wristed statement. Something about this tragedy could have been worse. That was it. That was after his vacation on Martha's Vineyard with the billionaires and millionaires that he loves to pretend he hates so much. That's why I call this government zero. No borders, no language, no culture. Now let's go to a few callers on the Savage Nation. I'd like to focus on my book. I'd like to focus on Benghazi. I'd like to focus on uh, Biden. Anything you want to talk about. If you want to talk about the uh, story of Donald Trump, you can. 
I'm sure he'll be on the show in the next few days or next week. He's a busy guy. He's all over the place. And I have to make a point right now. He is going to appear in Iowa next week and introducing him as Ann Coulter. That is the biggest mistake he could possibly make. He is going to feed the left with red meat that will be used to castigate him. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. I don't know Ann personally. I have no idea what she thinks or what she does. But I do know that she uses words as hand grenades simply to sell books. And I do know that Coulter to introduce in Iowa is the biggest mistake of the Trump campaign. She is not qualified to do so. She is by far not the most qualified amongst the conservatives to introduce him. And I'm not looking for the job. I wouldn't do it. I wasn't asked to do it. And I couldn't do it. She could not do a worse job of damaging Donald Trump, in my opinion, if she tried to. Which leads me to my next point. I believe that what is starting to happen to the Trump campaign happened to many other very, very fine candidates in the past. They were very conservative. They then hire professional advisors who are Brutuses within, and they misadvise them, they undermine them, and they destroy them. That's what I fear right now. And the reason I say it is because Coulter introducing him in Iowa is the greatest mistake he could ever make. This is the Savage Nation. 855-400-7282 uh, is the phone number. WABC, Marianne, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Go ahead, please. You're on the air. All right. A, a whisperer, a, a whisper and a hummer, a, a, a breathless whisperer. That's that's what I got on a national show. Line six, Marianne, WABC. Go ahead, please. Marianne, are you there? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I was calling to comment on your last comment. I mean, I, I, I cut, off, cut you off kind of because I'm in my car and I thought that I'm on the cell phone. But um, I'm calling to, to comment on the thing about Sonny and the hero that stopped that guy. I was telling your screener that I actually broke down and I started crying. I started crying out of joy. I started crying, uh, crying because I was, I've been so fearful. I'm like, if I don't get in this country, and it's not. We have to harness this. We have to gather these people well, together. Uh, what were you crying? Wait, wait, stop. You were crying over the fact that our off-duty military took down that, that animal? Is that what you were crying over the pr in pride? You are crying with pride that they took down the animal with a machine gun? Yes, sir. I was so proud of them. I what you ought to be crying over is the fact that your president didn't honor them. You ought to be crying over the fact that your president is playing for the other side one way or the other. That's what you ought to be crying about. KSFO, Dave, your opinion counts. What's on your mind? Yeah, hi, Dr. Savage. Um, uh, I have a feeling uh, the entire State Department email controversy is simply noise, uh, like sleight of hand, like a magician's uh, misdirection to keep the world away from her private emails. There were 30,000 private emails that she is insisting have been erased. And I believe that's where the real crime exists. Uh, the quid pro quo for the Clinton Foundation while she was Secretary of State. I think she knows she can deal with the state.gov problems. Uh, and uh, may cost her the election. But I don't think it's going to put her in jail. Well, <laughs> how, many, how many millions of dollars did her and her husband make? in trading information that she had from the State Department that she gave to others in order to get him these huge speaker fees. Someone brought that up yesterday. Don't you think that's a big factor? Absolutely, and I think that was done while she was Secretary of State using her personal emails. There is precedent for this. During okay, the so ha well, having said that, do you think that th this email uh, scandal is going to finally, finally bring her down, yes or no? Uh, I think it'll bring down her run for presidency, but I and then they'll leave, and then they'll leave her alone. Then they will not they will not prosecute. Is that correct? Correct, and they won't pursue. In other words, the very same very same abuse of power we saw with Sandy Berger, who stole classified documents out of the Library of Congress in his filthy, disgusting underwear, and nothing happened to Sandy Berger. At the very top, they can get away with virtual murder. They can destroy a nation. They can bomb a village. 
they can uh, cause an assassination and they can be found out and nothing happens to them. That, my friends, is not a democracy. That, my friends, is a dictatorship. Government zero. No borders, no language, no culture. One day you'll come to understand what that title really means. Many people say, Michael, look, your next and last book is the sin qua non of everything you've ever written. Fine. But what do you mean by government zero? I don't get it. What is that book about? Why do I need it? Well, I'm not here to sell you that book today. I'm here to focus you on what went on in Benghazi according to what I thought happened, what has come out since from intelligence sources, and what's liable to happen uh, tomorrow. 855-400-7282. WSBA, Kevin, you're on the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Thank you, Dr. Savage, for taking my call. Uh, my son is in the U.S. Army. Uh, when he graduated Fort Sill for basic training, uh, the women only had to do 11 push-ups was their requirement for uh, the military. Right. Uh, two other quick points in regard to the military. There is a right, That's what my friend, the real Army Ranger, told me they've done to the Ranger School. They've lowered the standards so that virtually anybody can pass it. And that's why when we saw the big Stalinist show trial last week of women in the Rangers, I said, holy God, the only people laughing... Uh, are ISIS and the North Koreans. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. With all due respect, the fact is, we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest, or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? It is our job to figure out what happened and do everything we can to prevent it from ever happening again, Senator. Standard government lie to make sure it doesn't happen again. Just as long as those at the top are never punished for having let it happen to begin with. Americans who thwarted train attack at France's top honor. Meanwhile, your vacationing president came back and said virtually nothing. That, to me, was the most symbolic example of who he really is. When I saw that even the socialist president of France, Hollande, high taxation, liberal on every issue, recognized heroism when he saw it and gave these guys the, the 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 top honor the legion of honor i said i have a new respect for Holland. i don't like his policies but I, I like the man i respect the man not his policies in the case of obama i don't respect his policies nor the man do you understand why do you understand why obama provokes such hatred in the american people oh tell me about the people who like him we know who they are i'm talking about other people who absolutely despise Obama. Do you know why he's so despised? Despite his liberal policies? Not just solely because of his liberal policies, because the man provokes a certain visceral reaction to his actions. He won't say a word about the Americans who gave the world a lesson in courage. Why? Why do you think President Obama refused to acknowledge the three Americans who got France's top honor. I want you to think about that. This is the same President Obama who will not use the word Islam or Muslim. This is the same man who will not call any terrorist attack a terrorist attack. But the President of France said, faced with the evil called terrorism, there is a good, that's humanity. You are the incarnation of that. He said, you may be servicemen, in your day-to-day -day lives, quote, but on Friday you were simply passengers. You behaved as soldiers, but also as responsible men. Do you understand that? The accused jihadist, 26-year-old Ayub El Khazani, had a machine gun and a knife when he was confronted by our American heroes. Your president said nothing, while the socialist president of France said, the world admires your courage, your sang-froid, your spirit of solidarity. That's a leader. That's a man with character. 
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. Rock and Roll Tuesday on The Savage Nation, because I can't wait uh, till Friday to play the music I love so much. So in hour one, we talked about the incriminating Clinton email revelations uh, and the Libyan terrorists who killed Ambassador Stevens and what the hidden emails may have to do with that. And I read from pages 66 to 72 of Stop the Coming Civil War. We talked about Obama being the embodiment of government zero, no borders, no language, no culture. And the proof of that was the president of France bestowing France's greatest honor upon our three heroes barehandedly subduing a radical Islamist with a machine gun and a knife. And the president of France stands like a giant next to the president of the United States of America. Some housekeeping questions on the Savage Nation. Have you noticed how good my voice sounds since yesterday? Apparently the engineers adjusted the compeller. Now I have no idea what a compeller is. But as I listened to the replay of my show, I noticed my voice had become tinny. I have a great range in my voice. And I, I felt something was wrong since we moved studios from one location in Dallas to another. It sounded limited. And so I complained and they said, let's do it. And they adjusted a compeller. I don't know what a compeller is. I'll have to find out what a compeller is. But my voice is far more compelling in case you don't know. Now we go to some sound on the Savage Nation that will show you what this nation has become. Here is a woman calling 911 because she got bad Chinese food. Listen to this clip one. Alliance Police and Fire, where's your emergency? At Main Moon in College Plaza. What's the problem? I have bought some Chinese food and it's not to par to me and I asked to get my money back and they acting like they don't understand me and took my food and won't give me my money back. What's your name? Tracy McLeod. And this is why you call 911. Um, what am I supposed to do? Jump over the thing and beat them up and get my no, money back? I would have called the regular police line instead of the life threatening emergency line. I will. Oh, well, they transferred me. Wait a minute. They transferred me to you. Send someone to you. There's a classic American voter, very well informed American voter. Now you understand the, uh, the, uh, the government we have. See, I have a, I have a very strong opinion about who should be able to vote. All illegal aliens, of course, shouldn't be here and they shouldn't be allowed to vote. That's a given. That's the law of the land. But since Obama breaks the law of the land as often as he prefers, they do vote. That's number one. I believe anyone who is unfortunate enough to wind up on welfare should lose the right to vote. Uh, and so long as they're on welfare, any, any form of public assistance, they don't vote. It's really quite simple. If you're on welfare, you're going to vote for anyone who says he's going to give you something for nothing. If you're collecting food stamps, you should lose the right to vote until you're back on your feet, until you have something to contribute to society. Then you get the right to vote. It shouldn't just be given to you because you happen to be here. You need to earn the right to vote. And if you're not contributing in any way, why should you have the right to vote? Now, what's interesting about this is that there's a, um, an article I found that I put on michaelsavage.com. I got to show you the picture. It's number two on the top right. It shows a picture from the Great Depression of American men walking with their heads down, some in army uniforms, and they're passing a big poster, a big bulletin, uh, uh, you know, like a bulletin, a board on the highway in a town. It says, jobless men keep going. We can't take care of our own chamber of commerce. I said, God in heaven, do we need such signs here in America? Illegal aliens keep going. We can't take care of our own. 
what would be wrong with putting up billboards in towns which say illegal aliens keep going. We can't take care of our own. Why has it become a requirement that we take care of the world's poor? And I am speaking as an immigrant son because my ancestors, although they were poor, had pride and self-respect. They would rather have thrown themselves off a fire escape than take a dime of, of, of government assistance. Well, anyway, that's then and this is now. Here's another article from my website, link from Fox News. Hard left UK poll who compared US to ISIS poised to be next labor leader. Take a look at his bug eyes. He looks like 95% of the people who work for Obama. Why is it that all of the crazy liberals have these extraordinarily weird bug eyes? What's about the bug eyes and liberalism? They look crazy to me. Absolutely crazy. All right, let's go to some of the callers. WBAP, Maria, line one, what's on your mind? Hi, Michael, Michael. I wish you were my neighbor. I will bake a loaf of bread for you every week. You are one god sent man, and if every man in the whole world thinks those ideas and thoughts, such a just thought, thought, I tell you this world will be a better world. No, I, I happen to like gluten, so I would accept the bread. But what's on your mind today, Maria? Well, I just wanted to talk with you because you're a very special person, and you are like a prophet, enlightening the people in the whole world about the evils in the world that are happening. I am a very helpful person as far as power, but I'm glad I don't have power because I might take the power wrong and do the wrong thing like such a people do. Um, anyways, I just want to say hello to you. Maria, are you a woman of faith? A. That's the problem with me. Yesterday you touched my heart, but I didn't say this right off the bat because the color... Well, yeah, for those who didn't listen yesterday, I talked about the uh, effects of child molestation on adults, the long-lasting effects on adults who... Uh, walk around with such pain and never talk about it. It was an amazing program. Is that what you're referring to? No, I'm referring to the one part when you said, oh, my son told me that that was a blessing. He made that. A oh, when we were in the airplane and I said, I've lived much longer than I thought I would. And I said, long life is both a blessing and a curse. And my son said, no, dad, it's a blessing. And then I described what happened in the airplane afterwards. That story? Yeah. Yeah, yes, but the best thing that about you was that you said, you said, God hears prayers. I have faith. Yes, I dare by the grace of God, and it's a gift of God to give us faith. Well, I don't know. I don't want to keep re repeating it because uh, many people think that when you talk about faith, you're doing it as a phony just to attract people who are, who are naive. But the fact is, is that each man has to determine for himself, each woman, whether or not they believe in something. And I wanted to express it because it was appropriate in terms of what occurred on that airplane. And I thank you for hearing that. I didn't do it for show. I did it for tell. It's that <laughs> I did it for tell, not for show. And I don't mean to make it a, a whole story. It's just what happened. That's all. Uh, let's see. Is this a question, Kate, on WJR Line 7? Go ahead, please, Kate. What's your point? I'm not quite sure what it is. Yes, Dr. Savick? Yes, you're on the air. What's on your mind? Yes, um, I was just calling to talk about the uh, demasculation of the military. All right, so what's your point? Well, my point is, um, I, in 2012, I, I, went on a, I was on a female engagement team. I'm a former sergeant in the Marine Corps, and I absolutely agree with you um, that we, we really don't belong there over with them, but it, from a different aspect, it was... Um, I saw firsthand how my male Marines, who were so wonderful to us, they're just great men, how they would, um, on foot patrols, put themselves in harm's way. Just They were very distracted and just trying to protect us, which is just such a wonderful, beautiful thing. But it made me feel awful being there because I wanted them to just focus on their own safety, focus on the mission, and it's really a distraction to them. And, um, and you're, you're I right. Kate, okay, this is a very important call that you're making. You you are a former sergeant in the Marine Corps. I am, and I and I love I love the Marine Corps. I loved it absolutely. I love being able to contribute to it. 
All right, but uh, what, are you actually you actually believe that women in combat roles are a distraction and, and put the the uh, platoon in danger? I absolutely saw this firsthand. I was embedded with an infantry unit. I I was there. I, we were shot at, and I was there. So the men overly protected you, putting themselves in the whole platoon and the whole mission at risk. So I have a question for you. You obviously haven't expressed this within the Corps to other uh, to commanders, have you? I have. They they brush you off. To be honest, I'm not in anymore. I'm former, and I'm very proud of the service that I had. But they do not listen to you. They want to hear from the feminist female Marines, which there are a lot. I don't have yeah. to be. Well, one. oh, of course, they they are very important to have them for show. I get it. I'm very. All right, Kate. I, I this is an amazing call. I can't even comment on it other than it's astounding. It's unbelievable to me. A uh, woman jailed after calling 9-11 over subpar Chinese food, and she votes, no less. You heard that sound, right? She votes. Can you believe this? Now what I'm about to play for you borders on this can't be true. Samantha Power, a longtime, lifetime anti-American leftist fanatic, uh, has given an interview where she says the United States is injecting LGBT rights into the DNA of the United Nations. She does not talk about the rape the kidnapping, the slavery of young girls. She talks only about homosexuals in clip two. You have to, you have to listen to this to believe this. Listen carefully. It was uh, a very moving meeting. Uh, the attendance was, I would say, uh, excellent and cross-regional. Everybody has read uh, about uh, what ISIL and what um, others are doing to LGBT people. LBG, LGBT people around the world, but it's another thing entirely to hear personal testimonies. While others spoke, including members of the Security Council and other member states, uh, photos also were uh, projected uh, that depicted uh, what ISIL is doing to LGBT persons or those suspected uh, of being LGBT. This is her highest priority. This is the most important priority to our ambassador to the UN, Samantha Power, which is LGBT rights uh, around the world. She had nothing to say, so far as I know, uh, about the kidnapping and industrial rape of Christian and Azidi women, the burning of churches, nothing, nothing at all. There's only one agenda to the Rainbow uh, Administration, and that marches on, and marching on it does. The time is 17, 18 minutes after the hour. The phone number is 855-407-282. I am your host of this interactive talk show, The Savage Nation. I'd like to talk about the topics I've raised or any others right here on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. I'm in the wrong field to begin with. I mean, if it was all about money, I would have been a disc jockey. I was reading an article this morning. I could not believe my eyes, the twisted nature of our society. DJ Calvin Harris outdoes Jennifer Lawrence with $66 million earnings. Scotland's Calvin Harris on Monday topped the Forbes list of the world's highest paid DJs, earning an estimated $66 million in an annual payday that surpassed Hunger Games actress Jennifer Lawrence and reflected the explosion of electronic dance music. Harris, 31, a record producer, has worked with the likes of Rihanna and Neo, blah, 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 blah. He's also... Blah, blah, blah. Harris has estimated a haul of $66 million from his music work and endorsements. Oh, so it's with the underwear ads for Giorgio Armani. Okay, it's really not the records. The rise of dance music has been astronomical. I happen to be in the right place at the right time, Harris told Forbes. Harris was followed by French DJ David Guetta, who made $37 million, who plays in Las Vegas and Ibiza. He was one of the headliners at this year's Coachella Festival in Southern California. Dutch DJ Tiesto came in third with 36 mil, while American Skrillex and Steve Aoki rounded out the top five, tying with $24 million apiece. Forbes estimated earnings from music endorsements and other fields for the 12 months ending June 1, 2015, to compile the list. 
EDM, that's dance music, has been one of the fastest growing genres of music around the world and was crowned at the 2012 Grammy Awards and EDM was given its own stage at the annual music and the industry ceremony. That's pretty amazing. So dance music is back and DJs are making $66 million a year or as low as $24 million a year. Interesting. Just shows you our priorities and wonder why we have no science uh, in the United States of America anymore. 855-407. I mean, if you could choose between killing yourself to get a PhD and becoming a scientist, crossing the minefields of feminism and liberalism and political correctness, or spinning records and making whatever you could make, what would you do? Would you kill yourself to get a higher degree? Or would you abandon science and become a disc jockey? That's all. It's that simple. What else do we have in the news that I haven't played yet? We played Samantha Powers. We did the emails. I had another sound piece. Oh, here, I have it over here. I got to get to this. Ah, this you got to hear. Here is the University of Wisconsin director of something, Everett Mitchell, saying that police use people who steal as an excuse to arrest us. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. Look, look who's running universities now. You got to listen to clip nine. You'll understand everything you ever wanted to know about American universities. Clip nine in the Savage Nation. I don't know about you all, and I, I, I know if it's being taped. I may not ever get a job at Walmart, but I just don't think that they should be prosecuting cases or going up cases for people who steal from Walmart. I'm just, I just don't mm. think that, right? Mm. I don't think Target or all the other places, the big box that have insurance, they should be used as justification. The fact that people steal from there as justification to start engaging in aggressive police practices immediately arrest them that's not free speech it's encouraging it's encouraging criminal activity but that that's who the universities hire now university director everett mitchell says police are using stealing is stealing as an excuse to arrest us okay now you understand why my next book is called government zero after eight years of no borders no language no culture no criminal justice and an attack upon everything that's decent You'll come to understand. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. He was so big at 13, it was unbelievable. Frankie Lyman from my day. You don't know who he is. You know who I miss now? It's a strange thing. I, I miss Michael Jackson's music. It's the strangest thing on earth. When he was alive, I didn't really care for it. And now it's like coming back in my head. I miss the voice of Michael Jackson always in the background. Now it's like some chick music that you can vomit from. All you hear is Taylor Swift in every elevator I go into. I go to buy a pair of man's underwear. It's Taylor Swift. I can't stand it. At least Michael Jackson, I mean, had something to it. And anyway, I was thinking about love. We talk about such horrible things on radio. Uh, the world's coming to an end, which it really is. I mean, our world's coming to an end. And don't assume that the world that it's being replaced by is any better. It's a lot worse. And I was thinking about love. And what is love? Do you know that love is the most popular search on Google? Did you know that? I've talked about molestation yesterday. I've talked about death and dying. I've talked about all sorts of things that are important to talk about. But we never, ever talk about love. And yet, it's the most popular search on Google. I was shocked to find out. What is love was the most searched phrase on Google in 2012. And so, the Guardian newspaper gathered writers from the fields of science, psychotherapy, literature, religion, and philosophy, who gave their definition of the word love. So the physicist they interviewed says love is chemistry. Powerful neurological condition like hunger or thirst, only more permanent. He says, we talk about love being blind or unconditional in the sense that we have no control over it. He said, but love is basically chemistry. Well, while lust is a temporary, passionate, sexual desire involving the increased release of chemicals such as testosterone and estrogen in true love he says or attachment and bonding the brain can release a whole set of chemicals pheromone, pheromones dopamine norepinephrine serotonin oxytocin and vasopressin however from an evolutionary perspective love can be viewed as a survival tool a mechanism we have evolved to promote long-term relationships, mutual defense, and parental support of children, and to promote feelings of safety and security. That's from Jim Al-Khalili, who was a theoretical physicist and science writer. Then they interview some, uh, I don't know, the Eisen are already throwing me off. Who's this one? Uh, 
Okay, a psychotherapist and author of Couch Fiction. When I see the bug eyes and the short hair already, the psychotherapist says love has many guises. She says, unlike us, the ancients did not lump all the various emotions that we label love under one word. They had several variations. See, I, I said that. See, I told you this many times on the show that the English language is, is our limitation. We have only one word for love. Uh, I love my mother. I love these meatballs. I love my bicycle. I love my dog. I love the sunrise. We're all using, we're using one verb for all of the loves. But the Latin has 16 verbs for love, you see. Because there's deep and usually non-sexual intimacy between close friends and family members. Or even as a bond forged by soldiers or teammates on a team as they fought, fight or, or play alongside each other. And that's a, a verb that should be different than the love that we use. So th that's an interesting one. But she didn't say that I did. Let's go to the next one. Uh, philosopher and writer says, the answer remains elusive in part because love is not one thing. Love for parents, partners, children, country, neighbor, God, and so on, all have different qualities. Each has its variants. Blind, one-sided, tragic, steadfast, fickle, reciprocated, <laughs> misguided, and unconditional. That's good. That's well written. Let me read that again. Love, uh, different one. Each has its variants. Blind love, one-sided love, tragic love, steadfast love, fickle love, reciprocated love, misguided love, unconditional love. He says, at its best, however, all love is a kind of a passionate commitment that we nurture and develop, even though it usually arrives in our lives unbidden. That's why it's more than just a powerful feeling. Without the commitment, it is mere infatuation. Without the passion, it is mere dedication. Without nurturing, even the best can wither and die. That's well written. Julian Beguini wins the gold star. Now they interview a romantic novelist, Jojo Moyes, who writes romantic novels says love drives all great stories all right let's move on the nun says love is free yet binds us love is more i don't know i'm getting like a, not only i'm not only not only getting a migraine from this i'm getting a shortness of breath i feel a constriction in my neck and shoulder from it i better a benedict nun a benedictine nun says love is free yet binds us that's like a hippie thing free love what, what is she talking about Love is more easily experienced than defined as a theological virtue by which we love God above all things and our neighbors as ourselves for his sake. It seems, how can you love your neighbor? I myself don't love my neighbors. I, I for one, really detest most of my neighbors. One makes noise where I'd like to have them arrested. Another one burns smoke 300 nights a year, polluting the neighborhood yet has peace signs uh, on his door and calls himself a, an environmentalist. Burn smoke 300 nights a year, polluting the atmosphere. How can you love a neighbor like that? The paradox of love is that it is supremely free, yet attaches us with bonds stronger than death. It cannot be bought or sold. There is nothing it cannot face. Love is lo Okay, that's a religious viewpoint. That's a love of God. That's a nun. I understand that. I respect that. She's, a, she's in love with Jesus, and nobody can, you know, that's, okay, that's understood. But that, that's not the kind of love that people are Googling. What they're Googling is romantic love. The most popular search on Google is what is love? The most search phrase on Google. And I still don't know the answer, having read all of those, <laughs> those opinions. Nor am I going to ask you what your opinion is. It's certainly better than talking about other topics, by the way. 855-407-282. K-I-R-O. Cairo. I'm heard on Cairo in Washington. Tom, line seven, is my show broadcast on Cairo in Washington? You know, Mike, it's 570. I'm not sure if it is Cairo, but if, it, uh, if I'm mistaken, that's okay. Ain't it? Well, we better look it up before we say what the station is, but what's your point? Yeah, you know, this. Uh, um, to me, you're, you're kind of like a spiritual father in, in, in some ways, you know, and um, I appreciate that about you. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's not easy. And you care about... Well, wait, wait, hold What part is not easy, listening or being? Um, being. I mean, wait, is it not easy for you or not easy for me? Uh, it's probably... I was thinking it's not easy for anybody. You mean to be, to, to be a spiritual father on the radio is what you're saying? Yeah, because it's kind of a responsibility, you know, and, 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 uh, and there's a connection there, uh, you know, a heart connection. You know, you, uh, I, I can to tell you care and you're willing to... To back it up with, uh, you know, uh, Tom. I'm going to throw something out there right out of the blue. Are you are you a Native American? Negatory. Although I've got a lot of Native friends, I tell you that. 
I can hear it in your voice. I can tell you that. I can tell you your spiritual quest has taken you down those paths. Yeah. Yeah. You All know, right. I so, so okay. So you're saying you listen to the show not so much for the politics, but for the other elements, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, to make a, uh, you know. Yeah, but look, here's the thing. Here's my problem. I'm as flawed a man as you can find on the planet. I have so many deficits that I don't even want to talk about. I'm not here to make a confessional. I'm just an ordinary man with a lot of flaws. I've been gifted with certain attributes and certain talents, but I'm not really a spiritual father because I have so far to go myself. Can you understand that, Tom? I don't want to hold myself up in any category of being any spiritual anything. Yeah, yeah, sure, but, uh, you know, yeah, I, I'd buy that today, but it changed tomorrow. You know, you you might get a vision or a dream, and all of a sudden uh, it puts you in, in a different position, if, if you know what all I right. mean. So you're talking about when the visions come to me, such as the white owl of last year, when I dreamed that last January. I've, I haven't had one of those profound insights, or they've not come to me. Let's, it's not like I haven't had. They haven't had me. Uh, God stopped sending them to me, I guess you could say. I guess now that you bring it up, I think about it. I even painted the white owl last January. I stopped. You know that I've stopped doing watercolors? I used to paint watercolors last year. I stopped painting them. My inspiration is gone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can get that stuff stolen right out of you, and then you got to get back on your knees. And oh, that. my God. Do you ever know that? You know that. Inspiration can be stolen from a soul. That's true. Oh, yeah. You know, it's one of the reasons that I, I try to go in other areas on the radio show than pure politics. Like today, I started heavy with the politics on Benghazi and the emails. And now I'm moving into the other areas that I like to do. But the truth is, is that now that you, an unknown caller, calls the show and talks about it, I say to myself, where, where did my desire to painting go? to paint go? Why am I no longer inspired? It's not like I've given up. I'm just not interested in painting right now. And where are my visions? Why are they not coming to me anymore? Where'd they go? Well, I tell you, sometimes you uh, people put you under... People go to prayer for, for you, brother. And, and, and uh, there's more things behind the lines than, than, than you realize. And, and you're, uh, you know, you're, uh, you, you're, you pick up... Um, you're like an antenna. You know, you're a receiver. You know, and, and some guys... Uh, 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 value that you know and uh all right well i hear you. What, what my friend let me i gotta e ask you some more questions what motivated this call what are you trying to say to me well i, I tell you I, I was a little listening to this one of these mouthpieces uh from uh, uh who, who knows where work uh, on on the radio uh, and and I, I was just thinking where do these guys get their inspiration? Their BS is really uh, avid, really good, but the information sucks, you know. But they're really good at at at, at uh, uh, taking you for a dance, and um, so that, that's kind of I, I admit I, I am. But wait, what's that, what was this? What was this individual selling you? Some liberal ideas or what? Oh, something about uh, Obama's doing the trade thing and all and in the or whatever it was it was somebody else and you're saying he, he seemed like he was glib at what he was presenting but it didn't seem like it was truthful is that more or less what you're getting at oh yeah he can really take you for a dance ah uh, okay so there's a lot of glib talkers out there but they're selling us a bill of goods okay i hear you so you're saying you like listening to me because you feel the opposite is true but you know i'm a very moody person i got to tell you and everyone else listening there are some days I'm up, some days I'm down, some days I'm flat, some days I don't want to be here, some days I can't wait to be here. It's not like I'm a consistent individual. I, I, do you hear that in my voice? Well, you know, uh, here's where the grace of God can kind of like uh, move on you because you know uh, you can't do it with your ego alone, you know. And, uh... mm, hey. Well, I think you're onto something very deep. I've been trying to get in touch with you-know-who. Uh, recently and sometimes I stare at the holy book and I don't even want to open the pages sometimes I stare at uh, you know the heavens and there's nothing there for me and sometimes it's there you know 
So there's nothing you can do about these things. There's nothing consistent about relationships, whether it be with man or God, unless you're a very, very unique person. And I would say I am not. And I would say you have to be almost saintly in order to have a permanent relationship with God. That's a positive thing. I don't think the average person has that. Oh, that's for sure. That's why the, we, we all kind of need each other. One day I'm down and, and the other day you, you're up and, and, and all of a sudden you, you're my answer. You know what I mean? And well, see, Tom, here's the thing that I actually believe. I actually believe that all human beings, I know this is going to sound hippie and weird. I think that all human beings are interconnected. I truly believe that. As despicable as some people are, and I don't have to name ISIS, I don't have to talk about child molesters. I'm sorry to say we're all part of this gigantic organism called the human family. As hard as it is to understand that, I believe it's true. And it's hard for human beings to comprehend that. Now, that borders on, must we turn the other cheek to those who harm us? Well, the Christians teach us that for exactly that reason from that insight, which is that the man who, who brings harm to you is not so different than you. That's something that Christians teach that is a very healing thing. Uh, unfortunately, on a battlefield, it can get you killed. Unfortunately, in the streets of New York, but for the blink of an eye, that can get you killed. If you have a oneness with all brothers in the street, you can wind up with a box cutter in your guts. So you have to temper this philosophical knowledge that we're all one uh, with the very real knowledge that there are some ones amongst us who belong behind bars, et cetera. You see what I mean? Yeah. You, 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 you know, Mike, in the Our Father says, for, 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 I want to forgive this guy so I can get forgiven by... by uh, by the creator and, and like that was a big well that's what i was getting at yesterday with the molestation which is hatred for those who molested an adult will only imprison you and the only healing is to forgive that individual who did that to you otherwise you're imprisoned forever with hatred and on that note my friend i wish that we could talk further but we can't other than to say I thank you very much for this uh, phone call to the Savage Nation. We're just so short of time. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. It is the Savage Nation, little Dell Vikings, to take us to the end of hour two on the program. One last call. I have to get to this one. Tom, online, fire away. What's the topic? What's your point? Well, my father used to say to me, God rest his soul, uh, love is an acronym, a largely overrated, vicious enigma. Oh, God. I, 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 assume, your father, I, I assume your father was a cynic. Uh, well, he was divorced quite a few times and uh a little bitter <laughs> he said love is a love stands it's an acronym stands for largely overrated vicious enigma so i guess he had a pretty bad relationship with women yeah yeah uh, my mother now, here's one for you story just came out from a psychiatrist who says hillary is lonely has trouble expressing her feelings and yearns for an intimate relationship with a powerful woman claims noted shrink who puts the presidential hopeful on the couch Dr. Alma Bond says Hillary's oppressive upbringing by her father, you Rodham, made her ambivalent towards men, caused her to be tolerant of her cheating husband. When Hillary's mom threatened to leave her father, the broad-shouldered man bellowed, don't let the do doorknob hit you in the A on your way out. So she's looking for a powerful woman, according to this shrink. Wow. And she says Huma Abedin does not fill the intimacy vacuum in Hillary's life. God damn. <laughs> Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. With Hillary Clinton, the email scandal Benghazi, we suspect she's covering up some real serious stuff. 
or else she wouldn't have erased them. That's clear. We know that. And I pointed out that I wrote about it on pages 66 to 72 of Stop the Coming Civil War. And you can read it for yourself because 150,000 of you bought it, which means 300,000 of you have read it. It's there in the book. Read it for yourself. Now, this hour, Hillary is lonely and has trouble expressing her feelings and yearns for an intimate relationship with a powerful woman, claims noted shrink, who puts the presidential hopeful on the couch. Dr. Alma Bond says Hillary's oppressive upbringing by her father, Hugh Rodham, made her ambivalent towards men, it caused her to be tolerant of her cheating husband, claims Dr. Bond. And authors su suggest that Rodham's stinginess and anxiety about money contributed to Hillary's need to accumulate great wealth. <laughs> Anyway, this is really some good stuff. All right, so let me read some of it. Dr. Bond, a psychoanalyst and author who holds a PhD from Columbia and did postdoc studies from the Freudian Society, has been studying Hillary Clinton from afar for many years. And she says that Hillary, age 67, has unsuccessfully looked for a female equal for years, despite the closeness of her personal assistant and closest aide, Huma Abedin. Okay, let's just scan through this. She's followed his career. Dr. Bond has drawn the conclusion that one of the Democratic presidential candidates' biggest problems is her inability to express her feelings. And it all began back in her childhood in Park Ridge, Illinois, a neighborhood devoid of Jews, blacks, or Asians. That, that's typical liberalism. You know, they're always for all the minorities because they don't know any. They never did. The, the surest sign someone is a bigot is when they talk about how much they love Minorities. That's the surest sign that they're a bigot. Her father, Hugh Rodham, a, a curtain salesman who died of a stroke in 1993 at age 82, was a combative, working class man from eastern Pennsylvania who was riddled with prejudices against anyone who wasn't like him. He raged about minorities. <laughs> he raged about minorities in derogatory terms when he was not subjecting his family to his own violent emotions. Oh, this is so rich. Hillary, with her mom and dad and brothers, you, Senator and Tony, living day to day with her father's mercurial personality, drove Hillary closer to her nurturing mother. Okay. Let's see if there's anything, any other grist here for the mill. Her father was disappointed in life and lied about winning a college football scholarship to Penn State. Oh, this is heavy. Here's the next one. He was a bull uh, blank artist, a family once member once said. But that skill made him a good salesman when hawking the drapes and lace curtains that he manufactured for hotels and offices. Hillary's father, Hugh, was a bruiser at home and excessively spanked the couple's three children. He verbally abused Hillary's mother, Dorothy, and Dr. Bond describes their relationship as sadomasochistic. Mm. Hugh had been a chief petty officer in the Navy during World War II and trained recruits. His home life out of the service found him still barking out orders, ridiculing family members, belittling their achievements and what he viewed as character building. Hillary never gave up trying to please her father, and at five years old, asked him to marry her. A what? Hillary never gave up trying to please her father, and at five years old, asked him to marry her? His response was to whack her in the butt and run off to find her mother, who offered comfort in the form of a chocolate bar. All three Rodham children were in denial about their father's child-rearing standards as being abusive and were led to believe they were empowering they, they were empowering by the master bully himself. The, she writes, they were in fact abused children. It is more likely that they used the defense mechanism of denial in which one does not see what one wishes were not true, Dr. Bond writes. Watergate journalist Carl Bernstein described you and their family life in his own book on Hillary as anything but father knows best. Okay, big deal. Uh... How she grew up to be the person she is with so abusive and mean-spirited a father is beyond my comprehension, writes Dr. Bond. As a result of the oppressive upbringing, Hillary doesn't express her feelings and has made her ambivalent towards men as well as tolerant of a cheating husband. Bond writes, it must be the example of Hillary's parents' marital life that allows Hillary to put up with her husband's infidelities. Ooh, that's cruel. Hillary understood as a child that her father's crass criticism was not personal, but simply part of the way he was. If Dorothy threatened to leave him and take the children, the six-foot-two broad-shouldered man bellowed out, don't let the doorknob hit you in the A on, the, on your way. <laughs> on your way out. Oh, this is, 
this is amazing. I, okay, so this is a psychoanalyst, and uh, da, 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 the author says that you run well. So what does that mean at the end of the day? I don't know. I'm no idea. Oh, so she's looking for a strong woman as a result of the father. Doctor Bond believes Hillary is lonely at the top and craves a female equal. How does she jump to a female equal? With the stinginess in her early years, Hillary has no intrinsic talent for dressing well. You mean a pink jumps a pink pink jumpsuit doesn't count, Doctor? You mean dressing with a drape that looks like it was pulled off a wall is not your idea of a good clothing? Uh, she hasn't escaped the pantsuits routine, but she still also doesn't believe it matters how she dresses anyway, the author surmises. She was, quote, the drab girl nobody gave a second look at until Blinton, Bill Clinton came along. Hillary's accepting that her loneliness is the price she has to pay to be at the top of the political world. Uh, Bond concludes that ultimately she believes Hillary is a wonderful human being with deep flaws whom anyone be, would be lucky to call a friend. And here's the last paragraph. The doctor describes Clinton as a frank and outspoken person rather than a truthful one. Like most politicians, she bends the truth for political reasons, and she calls her a healthy narcissist as well, interested in the welfare of the world and not just focused on herself. Well, I'll let you decide for yourself about the shrinks analysis of Hillary and the uh, girl she's looking for, the girl of her dreams. The only good note of this story is that it shows Hillary and Bill on their vacation this summer, outside their fifty thousand dollar a week vacation home, that's fifty thousand a week vacation home, and Bill Clinton is walking with a dog named Tally, who is a toy poodle. I like Bill Clinton more now. Uh, he has a toy poodle on the, about the size of my dog Teddy, so he can't be that bad a guy. Hillary, on the other hand, has a dog named Maisie, who is also a cute small dog. Don't, you know, small dogs are in right now because they have been for a while. Because when they get rambunctious, you pick them up like a pocketbook and put them in your arm and you do what you want with them. Don't try that with a mastiff or a pit bull. You know, you, you lose your hand in an arm. But uh, that's the beauty of a small dog. I see a lot of big men with small dogs now. I have for years I've talked about it. So many men don't have a woman in their lives because women have become mean and un incapable of giving men the respect and love that men are entitled to. I know that you don't want to accept what I just said. So men are turning actually to dogs. And, and it's amazing. You see guys, big burly guys with little dogs everywhere now. This is not something you would have seen years ago. If you saw a big guy with a little dog, you would have figured, eh, you know, he's lighting the loafers, as we used to say. But no, not anymore. It's just that the guys need something to love and something kind and friendly and furry, I guess. And there it is. That's a continuation of our, our discussion of what is love from the last hour. And it also ties the show together neatly because we're talking about Hillary and Benghazi at the beginning of the show. When you think, I mean, there's a method to my madness. You know, I started with the Benghazi thing. I went to love. Now we're back to Hillary and dogs and love. I mean, it all, it all uh, is a unicorn here. The unicorn matches here. Donna on WBAP is mad at me on some reason. Donna, what are you angry at? What did I say that got you angry? I am upset with you. I am offended by your statement where you said anyone on assistance should not be able to vote. Right. Well, what, what is offensive about that? What offends me is that I have been a teacher for 30 years. I have taught both in the public school and the private school, and I've currently been at uh, a private school for the last 17 years. I tell you that because I'm a very stable person. I was married for 22 years. Okay, but I don't need your whole life story. I didn't say you shouldn't vote. I said anyone who receives public assistance should should temporarily lose the right to vote because any demagogue that comes along that promises them a raise in welfare or food stamps is going to get their vote. And I don't think the rest of us can afford that. I think I'm making good sense logically. Where am I flawed here? Well, I was married for 22 years when my husband left, and I, my youngest child is now receiving... Um, assistance. And because of that, you tell me I should not be able to vote. Let me tell you. I no, I, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't you say you're working? I am working and I'm going to school so I can get a... So why should... Wh where do you conclude that I said you shouldn't be able to vote? Because, because my child receives assistance. So I am receiving assistance. And no, your child is receiving assistance. You're not. You're, are, you, are you not paying taxes on your income? Of course you are. I am. So you're a tax-paying citizen. 
No one said that you should be denied the right to vote. I'm making a statement that has no racial connoto conno connotations in it whatsoever. So let's rule that out already from all those who are jumping to the wrong conclusion. Anyone who is on public assistance is easily manipulated by a demagogue who will promise them increased benefits. That is an unhealthy situation. And my my su suggestion is if you go on on assistance, you temporarily lose the right to vote. And then when you're back on your feet, you regain the right to vote. Why is that wrong? I'm, I am receiving assistance. And no, you just said wait. You just said your daughter. You just said your daughter is not you. My son is, but he falls under me because he is under eighteen years. So I receive the. All right. So you raise a very interesting legal uh, distinction in my statement that certainly has to be adjudicated properly and managed properly. And I think in situations such as yours, uh, the working person should c continue to be able to vote. And the individual, the child is receiving welfare, obviously couldn't vote anyway. So I don't think it would apply to you. All right. That, that. All right. Now, I'm glad we talked about it. You have the right to vote. Uh, pass him a maribus. That's all. Uh, WBAP, Neil, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Michael, I think you've come into your own spir spiritual, in a spiritual sense. That's because, you know, we're all pushing for a reason. And I think you, you've come to, to know that your reason is to to start talking about spiritual things in your life. You know, we're not getting any younger. <laughs> no, no, we're not. No, we are not. I'm glad you noticed that. And, and I think the things that you talk about makes a lot of sense to me, and I don't understand why it doesn't make a lot of sense to some people. But it's, a lot of it is just common sense, you know. And, and if we think... So, but your main point is that you think that I'm coming to uh, recognize that I was put here on earth at this time in my life to talk about spiritual things more than I'm doing. Yes, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I look and I listen to you every day and I, I, I notice how you talk about different topics. And, and it's, so, it's so refreshing to know that, 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 that you do such things as that because, because it's, there, there are a lot of other things that we need to hear other than politics. And that's what I think. I, I Look, the election is not until 2016. How in the world can people talk about this day and night for the next year and a half? I don't understand. Well, they, a lot of people don't have the substance that you have. You know? well, I don't know. Look, I, everyone has to do what they can do and how they do it. All I can say is, you know, if a political story comes up that rings like an interesting to me, I'll, I'll talk about it. But to talk about it to the exclusion of everything else on earth is, is exhausting and frankly limiting. I mean, the human being is much more rich than that, richer being than that, than just a political being, right? Right. Let me tell you this, Michael. You were talking about, I think last week you were talking about people that would just kill things, you know, such as insects that would just out of the blue. And that always annoyed me coming up as a kid. You know, why would someone just jump on a, a, a they would see an ant, Oh, 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 you heard me say that I try to avoid stepping even on a bug. I'm the same way, Michael, you know. In a, or, or I let a fly out of a house. Well, I mean, if it's too many of them, I'll put fly paper up. I, I haven't had to do that in a number of years because I ceased using an outhouse in 1951. But the, the once we got indoor plumbing, I didn't need the fly paper anymore. But the thing is, I mean, to me, if a, if a creature, if a creature was created, I mean, who am I to kill it for no reason whatsoever? What's my point, right? Hey, brother, thanks for calling. I'm out of time. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Hey, Michael Savage. We are back on the Savage Nation. I thank you for listening to the show so intently. Many of you are with me for a full three hours. Uh, many of you tune in and out. Some of you just come in board uh, uh, in the third hour. And it's amazing when you analyze how many people listen to any radio show, any major radio show, that... At any 15 minutes, there are three times as large as the biggest football stadium in America listening to this show. That's a pretty awesome number when you think about that. And so if you'd like to converse on any of these topics, serious or light or heavy, I invite you to call 
7282. WJR, John, welcome to the Savage Nation on my idea that welfare recipients shouldn't vote. Go ahead, please. Oh, he dropped. Came and went. Okay. People don't, people, that's a very controversial idea. But it is a legal statement, by the way, uh, that if you're on welfare, you should temporarily lose the right to vote. I, I, I don't understand why that's so controversial. In other words, if you are on welfare, you are dependent on those of us who work and pay taxes. Let's start with that. And so if a demagogue like Obama comes along and promises you he's going to increase benefits for, the unemployed, for, the, uh, for those on welfare, the non-working on welfare... He's going to increase food stamps and benefits. Wouldn't you then vote for him? That's how demagogues rise to power, and that's how a nation is destroyed, through demagoguery. That's how a guy like, uh, 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 what's his name, Governor Brown got where he is. He catered to the illegal aliens through the SEIU union, and as a result of him working with the illegal alien lobbies for so many years, they elected him in California again. And the first thing he did was tax those of us who work harder than anybody else in the state. It's an upside-down system. He broke the border with Mexico. He's busted the economy of California. Don't go for the big lie that he's he saved the economy. He saved nothing. And if you really want to know what's going on in California, go watch True Detective and see the story about the train to nowhere that made many people hundreds of millions of dollars on land rights around the railroad tracks. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. All right, here's some breaking news. All right, it's enough with the music already. As you well know, the stock market apparently came back this morning. Well, the big money took the money out and bombed it out again. At the end of the day, it reversed again. The Dow Jones Industrial Average close is lower in the biggest reversal since October of 08. Stocks closed lower after a slight rally. And what it is is the smart money, the big money, is, in my opinion, manipulating the stock market again. Many of you are small investors, and many of you were terrified yesterday and were ready to bail out. So what they did to you today was is they let it come back up. And then you said, oh, thank God, I'm not going to get hammered. And they brought it up and up and up, and they put you to sleep. They narcotized you, and then they sold it off, and it went down again. And now you're stuck holding the, the bag again. That's all. You know, I don't invest for one reason. I don't invest in anything that I have no control over. I don't, I don't go to the horse racing track. I don't gamble with cards. I don't play craps. I'm not a gambler. The stock market is a gamble, and you don't control the table. You know, going to Las Vegas, you assume you're going to lose. See, the average guy says, I'm going to lose. I'm going in to lose $300. They take $300 with them to lose it. Now, that's really smart. Well, it's the same with the stock market. I tell you, don't put anything in the stock, stock market. You can't afford to lose. So if you lost it, that's your answer. Closed 1.3% lower after rallying nearly 3%. Blah, blah, blah. So what does that mean? It means they're playing with the market again. They raise it up so you don't d dump it. So by 11.30, it's up 197, and then you go to work and say, thank God, I'm safe now. All my Apple stock is okay. And you have a lunch, and you have an Apple for lunch, but they come back from lunch. It's down already 132 points. Then you get, get agita, and you go out and you grab a coffee. You think you're going to sell. It goes up uh, a little bit out there. I won't sell. And then by the time you go back, and after the coffee break, it takes a dive again. You think it's all happening by itself? I don't think so. I think they have the smartest psych psychologists in the world figuring out how the average Joe invest Joe and Jane investor out there thinks. And I think they're playing with the market right now to make sure you don't bail out till they, till they buy it as cheaply as they can. Anyway, it's one man's opinion. You know, whatever it's worth. You want to buy, you want to sell. Uh, some invest against this trend. Some say don't bail, it's a mistake to sell and don't sell, and others say a correction. Who knows what the answer is here? All I can tell you is what happened. So let's go back to the issues of the day on the Savage Nation. 855-407-282. Let me see what I didn't play for you yet. The best soundbite of the day is Jeb Bush saying, Anchor Baby, you're not going to believe this. Listen to the clips 18 and 19. Here's Jeb Bush, a man who once thought he could be president, who has now been so surpassed by Donald Trump, 
that the only thing left for him is to open a taqueria uh, in, in Texas. Listen to 18 and 19. My background, my life, uh, the fact that I'm immersed in the immigrant experience, this is, this is ludicrous for the Clinton campaign and others to suggest that somehow, somehow uh, I'm using a derogatory term. What I was talking about was the specific case of fraud being committed where there's organized efforts, and frankly it's more related to Asian people coming into our country, having children, in that organized efforts, taking advantage of, of, of a noble concept with his birthright citizenship. I support the 14th Amendment. All right, he's finished. Take a walk. Finished. Off the stage. No more rubber chicken dinners for him. He's done. That's all. Now he's attacking Asians. I can't wait for tomorrow's reaction to that one. Here's another little story for you. Michigan mayors to host Ramadan dinner on 9-11. That's right. You heard me. Ramadan may have ended July 17th and September 11th, maybe the anniversary of the worst terrorist attack on U.S. soil. Neither of those facts are stopping two mid-Michigan mayors from hosting a Muslim event on 9-11. Lansing Mayor Ving Verg Bernero and East Lansing Mayor Nathan Triplett are joining forces to host the Ramadan Unity Dinner in downtown Lansing on 9-11. So far, the Freedom From Religion Foundation has not weighed in on this heavily promoted use of taxpayer funds for an overly religious event. The Freedom From Religion Foundation is a group of the lowest vermin on the planet who only attack Christians because Christians are good and they never fight back. End of story. Here's another story that'll have you laughing. Director of Goodfellas and the Departed joins a campaign for the destruction of guns. <laughs> Direct Director Martin scores easy. Director Martin scores easily. Well known for hyperviolent films like Goodfellas, The Departed, and Casino, has joined the campaign for the destruction of guns. Scores easily will take part in Carl. McGrow's gun neutral campaign which asks that a real gun be destroyed for every fake gun that is used in a Hollywood production. So now we have Martin Scores Easily joining the gun control push after making fortune upon fortune from creating films riddled with violence, murder, mayhem, chopping people up, uh, and, and gun violence. That's all. I'm surprised that, uh, what's his name, Sean Penn is in on this one. Another one who makes one movie after another with, with gratuitous violence, and he's anti-gun. All right, you get the picture. The very real economic cost of birthright citizenship was analyzed in the National Review by Ian Tuttle. And apparently, uh, Peter and Ellie Yang, the subjects of Benjamin Carlson's new Rolling Stone essay, Welcome to Maternity Hotel California, paid $35,000 to have their second child in the United States. In the year 2012, Chinese state media reported 10,000 tourist births by Chinese couples in the United States. Other estimates skew as high as 60,000 tourist births. Following Donald Trump's call for an end to birthright citizenship and renewed attention on anchor babies, Carlson's expose on birth tourism seems to confirm that the current interpretation of the 14th Amendment works as a magnet for at least some parents across the globe. But just how big is the magnet? Well, one legal analyst who testified before the House Judiciary Committee in April said that between 350,000 and 400,000 children are born annually in the United States to an illegal alien mother residing in the United States and accounts for as many as one in 10 births nationwide. The cost of this, hold on to your seats, states that a child born in 2013 would cost his parents $304,000 from birth to his 18th birthday. Given that illegal alien households are low-income households in general, three out of five illegal aliens and their U.S.-born children live at or near the poverty level, one would expect that a significant portion of that cost will fall on the taxpayers, and that's according to to what is happening. Pay attention, all of you immigrant rights liars. According to CIS, 71% of illegal alien-headed households with children received some sort of welfare in 2009, compared with 39% of native-headed households with children. Illegal immigrants generally access welfare programs through their U.S.-born children 
to whom government assistance is guaranteed. All of this is covered in my forthcoming blockbuster, Government Zero. And one of the reasons I wrote that book, Government Zero, is so you have a record of what is being done to you as a taxpayer so that you can convince a friend, a neighbor, or a family member in 2016 to vote with their brains, not with their hearts. That's right, you heard me. The entire reason for my writing Government Zero is for you to go out as a missionary and to convert a friend or a neighbor, a normally closed-minded individual, and say, here are the facts in Michael Savage's Government Zero. Why don't you vote with your brains instead of with your heart? That's as simple as that. Nothing wrong with having a heart, but sometimes you have to have a brain when it comes to fiscal matters. It's that simple. And that's why my stance on welfare and voting is something to consider. If you're on welfare, I don't see what's wrong with a punitive measure being taken. After all, you're being given assistance by the taxpayer. So you have to pay a price for that. The price is you can't vote. And it encourages you to go out and get a job, look for work, if you care about voting at all, so you can vote again. It's an incentive to go and get back on your feet. I don't understand what's wrong with that idea. I have no idea why people are offended at that idea. 855-407-282, KSFO Dale, uh, you're up on the Savage Nation on the issue of welfare and voting. I brought it up today. How do you feel about that issue? Yeah, it's uh, a real killer. Uh, I uh, I don't know how many people realize it. The founding fathers, uh, there was three things that a person needed to have to vote. Yeah, but wait, we're not saying go back to the founding fathers. I think you had to be white to vote and you had to own property, right? Well, you had to own property, but you also had to be able to read and write and understand what the subjects were. Yeah, well, that, that automatically would exclude most politicians from voting. Uh, I understand that. Nobody can convince me that half our politicians are literate. But I'm not saying go back to the founding documents as to who can vote. I'm saying something else. I'm saying that if you're on welfare, you should temporarily lose the right to vote. Because otherwise, any demagogue who comes along and promises you some raise in your welfare or your food stamps like Jerry Brown or Barack Obama is naturally going to get elected. How do you think de Blasio got elected in New York? He got elected by appealing to the welfare class. What do you think happened? John, online, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Yeah, good afternoon, Dr. Savage. I just had a thought on the uh, religion uh, talk you were having a little bit earlier today and whether or not you're on the mystical side or straight religion side. I've always kind of thought, because of the way I grew up, <coughs> we, I lived on a street with many, many different religions, and so we all kind of compared and compared notes on their differences and their likenesses. And the one thought that always kept coming up time after time uh, as we're seeing now with population explosions, is is it possible that there's a finite amount of souls to go around? And as we run out of the finite amount of souls, you get the slash Charles Mansons or the crazies or the the people that hurt animals or others without any thought or feeling. Wow, maybe they that's it. You mean you get the ghoul? You get the ghouls walking around? Well, you know, if you think about it, maybe they. No, 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 I never thought of that. That explains that explains the population of Marin County. Well, yeah. <laughs> that, that there were no souls left to give out. They just created husks who think that it's their job to buy a car and a house and, and nothing else. Yeah, that would explain most of San Francisco and Marin County. Yeah, and I the think... Popu the population would be that, yeah. Yeah, it goes with a lot of different religions, too. There's, there's good parts, there's bad parts, but they all do have a common theme. And yet, nobody ever really can... Well, how would you explain the radical feminists who run Planned Parenthood, who are butchers, and would have very happily worked in Auschwitz, uh, torturing people, selling baby body parts, and laughing about whole babies being sold? Don't you think that those category, those those ladies would uh, would qualify for your de definition of people without souls? Well, sure. And again, what, 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 what we use to make it politically correct... We call it the people that do not either have honesty or integrity or, or self-determination or self-thought. Instead, Well, I think that a person can have a soul and lie and cheat and steal. I think a person can have a soul and be a, a bad person, but I don't think that what you're saying is the same thing. I think what you're saying is that there's a finite number of souls and that there's too many people being born and there aren't enough souls to go around. 
that's what I, I I've always kind of considered that as a possibility. It's an interesting thought. It would make for a fascinating novel. And there would, would there be some kind of factory upstairs in heaven where the souls are disseminated? I, how does how do they figure out which body to put a soul in? Uh, that again, again, when when you study different religions, that's why they're uh, all basically written horoscope esque. So you have to have someone interpret it for you, which takes... So in other words, if you're a religious person, when you die, your soul leaves your body. If you're not a religious person, when you die, nothing leaves your body because there was nothing there to begin with. Exactly. Wow. That's we have well, that, that would explain... That, that's a neat way to look at things. I got to tell you, it explains most of the people I run into, as I say, in the Bay Area. And, and not just the Bay Area. I live in one of our famous sanctuary cities in a famous sanctuary state, and we have unexplainable, horrendous crime and problems that happen. And that's that's one of the things when I get... Yeah, but I'm not referring to the illegal population as being soulless. Most of those people that I meet actually have very, very distinct souls. Sure. I'm talking about the indigenous population here. I, I see soulless ghouls walking around who have almost no concept of what humanity is. Right. I see how they I see how they treat their children. I see how vacuous they are with regard to feelings and thoughts. And I ask myself, is there a human being there? I mean, what's going on inside that person? But then again, that's for God to judge, not for me. The time is short. The day is long. The ideas are stupendous, and I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Are you... Alliance Police and Fire, where's your emergency? At Main Moon in College Plaza. What's the problem? I have bought some Chinese food, and it's not to par to me, and I asked <laughs> to get my money back, and they acting like they don't understand me and took my food and won't give me my money back. What's your name? Tracy McLeod. <laughs> and this is why you call 911? Um, what am I supposed to do, jump over the thing and beat them up and get my <laughs> money back? You could have called the regular police line instead of the life-threatening emergency line. I will oh, well, they transferred me. Wait a minute. They transferred <laughs> okay. me. Yeah. Someone to you. <laughs> she was arrested. She called 911 because she didn't like her Chinese food. And she votes. I love it. I love it. I really do. I think this is a case for the Attorney General. I think the Attorney General Loretta Lynch ought to send a task force to Chinese restaurants around America and make sure that they're not discriminating against other minorities because there's no question that there's some cultural problem here. And it may be based upon racism. I'm sorry. And I think that it, it, there should be a, a blue ribbon panel on the, the behavior of Chinese restaurants uh, towards American citizens and whether there's a difference in uh, the way that Chinese restaurants, especially the takeout ones, uh, behave towards customers. And I really do think this is important. I think Al Sharpton ought to organize a boycott uh, with bus, a, a bus ride around America to expose the latent mistreatment of certain individuals in Chinese takeout uh, stands. I don't think he should address the rapes, the murders, the kidnapping, and the slavery uh, by ISIS. I think what he should do is definitely look into Chinese uh, takeout restaurants and how they treat people. Well, that's it for the Savage Nation. Thanks for being here. Be here or be absolutely nowhere.